It's a scary world out there for little children, for teenagers, for college students. Scary for couples, for parents, for families. Scary for singles, empty nesters, senior citizens. It's a scary world out there. No, not because of the current political landscape. What's scary out there has nothing to do with being liberal or conservative. Nothing to do with the so-called progressive movement. What's scary out there has nothing to do with health care or social security, the economy or a retirement fund. What's scary out there has nothing to do with North Korea or Russia, <coughs> missiles or nuclear weapons. What's scary out there has nothing to do with global terrorism or religious fanatics. What's scary out there has nothing to do with the use of illegal drugs, the abuse of alcohol, crime or violence in the streets. What's scary out there isn't the first day of kindergarten, freshman year, choosing a career path, finding a spouse, taking care of a newborn, adjusting to an empty nest, or living a lonely life. No, what's scary out there are all the voices. All the voices that are constantly casting a shadow of doubt over the truth of God's word. What's scary out there are all the voices that are constantly attacking our faith, and our beliefs, and our very relationship with God. What's scary out there are all of the voices that want us to blindly follow them and abandon Him. Voices that are molding our children at a younger and younger age with more and more success. Children accepting as the norm what God clearly forbids in his word. Voices that are telling teens to find their identity and their self-worth in something, in anything other than in Christ himself. Their looks, their weight, their fashion sense, their grades, their athletic ability, their musical gifts. Voices that are leading our college students away from the truth of God's word through reason and logic and science, humanism, relativism, existentialism. Voices that are convincing families that they're just too busy for a devotion or to come to church or to just spend some time together. Voices that are demanding parents to go easy on their kids, to spoil them, and by all means, don't discipline them, for they never do anything wrong. Someone else's problem. <clears throat> Voices that are whispering in the ears of couples, God wants you to be happy, and if you can't find that happiness with your God-given spouse, then by all means, start looking somewhere else. Voices that are fanning the flames of materialism and selfishness in the hearts and minds of empty nesters through some sort of midlife crisis. Voices that are rattling the nerves of the elderly as they emphasize the frailties and the weaknesses of old age, leaving them with no hope or no confidence for any kind of meaningful future. Voices that we so eagerly and willingly and readily follow. Like ignorant and stubborn and foolish sheep. Sheep, that's what we are. That's what God compares us to. Sheep that were lost, 
found, but sheep that are still prone to wander and sheep that are still weak and sheep that are still prone to getting injured. We were lost in the darkness of sin and unbelief with our hearts darkened. We couldn't see the wisdom of God in the foolishness of the cross. We couldn't see the very Son of God born in human flesh to be our Savior from sin. With our consciences clouded, we couldn't clearly distinguish between right and wrong that moral law that God has written in our hearts. But worst of all, and most scary of all, is that there's still that wolf in sheep's clothing out there, that roaring lion out there who's looking for someone to devour, who wants to devour you and me and our faith and to rip us away from the Good Shepherd. But you see, his tactics haven't changed in some six, 7,000 years. The very question that Satan asked Eve in the Garden of Eden, did God really say, is the same question that he poses to you every day in all of those different voices that clamor in our ears, in our heads, and in our hearts. He wants us to doubt God and his truth and what he says here. And we listen. Our minds wander and we ignore the Word of God. Our hearts wander and we covet. Our hands wander and they steal. Our feet wander and they take us to places that we shouldn't go. Our lips wander and we gossip. We are dirty, filthy sheep whose wool is matted in sin and guilt whose feet are stuck in the mud of iniquity and who so foolishly take us to those places where we put our relationship with Jesus in jeopardy, all because we follow those other voices rather than the voice of our Good Shepherd. And our Good Shepherd sees this. And our Good Shepherd saw this. So what did he do? He became a sheep. Our good shepherd became one of us, the lamb of God, the lamb without blemish or defect. The lamb who would listen to one voice and one voice alone, the voice of his heavenly father, his will, his word, his truth, his law. And that lamb went through this life trusting that word, standing firm, holding his ground against Satan, never believing one of his single lies, never giving in to one of his single temptations, in fact, using the very words of God to send Satan running back to hell with his wicked tail between his evil legs. And then that Lamb of God, sinless Lamb of God, set his face toward Jerusalem. You talk about a scary world. You talk about a scary path that would end in death on a cross. But never once did he veer, and never once did he stray, and never once did he turn aside, even though he knew, he knew he was being led like a lamb to the slaughter. But he didn't open his mouth. He remained silent because he knew what needed to be done. Pay for sin. He needed to shed his blood. He needed to sacrifice his life. An altar. An altar not made of stone. An altar made of wood. An altar, a sacrifice that would never be set on fire, but one that would endure and experience the intense heat of God's wrath and anger over our, over our sin. That's what our good shepherd did. He took our place. 
He endured our punishment. He died our death. He forgives our sin. And you know that that's true. Because the good shepherd who laid down his life took it up again. He rose from the dead. Our good shepherd is a living shepherd. Our good shepherd is a victorious shepherd. Our good shepherd is a forgiving shepherd. He leads us to green pastures to feast on the living word of God found only in the gospel to drink from the living water that wells up to eternal life. In the truth of God's word, our good shepherd binds up our guilty consciences with the bandages of love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. In the truth of God's word, our good shepherd speaks to our fears. He answers our questions. He erases our doubts and he gives us courage and hope. The voice in the gospel, in word and sacrament, take and eat, take and drink. This is my body. This is my blood, broken, sacrificed for you, shed, poured out for you. That's his voice, that's his word. It's true, it's trustworthy. And that same word, that same truth is a lamp for our feet. It's a light for our path. It's living and active, sharp and powerful. No lie of Satan. Satan himself will never overcome it. Follow the voice of your good shepherd. That loving and encouraging voice, that voice of truth and that voice of life. When you think about it, of all those other voices out there in the world that are constantly speaking to us, has any one of them ever been willing to lay down its life for you? Did any of those voices out there ever lay down its life for you? Of course not. But your good shepherd did. And he took it up again to give you life. That's the voice, that's the shepherd that our students will follow every day this school year in their weekly chapel, in their daily religion class, in their catechism and confirmation instruction. That's the voice, that's the shepherd that our faculty will follow all year with their morning devotions, their faculty meetings, their personal study of God's word. So important for them, right? God's truth to expose Satan's lies. God's strength to resist Satan's temptations. God's forgiveness to silence Satan's accusations. But why just them? Why just our students? Why just our faculty? Jesus is your good shepherd too. And he's mine. This doesn't have to be a scary world. It's not a scary world for those who are following the voice of their good shepherd. Our society doesn't have to mold our children to accept as the norm what God clearly forbids in his word. Our teens won't need to find their identity or their self-worth in their grades or their appearance or their abilities if they find their identity and self-worth in Jesus Christ. Our college students don't have to swallow hook, line, and sinker, all the humanism and rationalism of, of the world if they're receiving a steady diet of God's truth. Our parents can say with Joshua of the Old Testament, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Parents can find joy and comfort and confidence in bringing their children up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Couples can make Christ a welcome guest in their home, the third strand in their marriage cord. That, my friends, is a cord that will not break as he empowers us to love and forgive and trust each other in that marriage relationship. Godliness with contentment will bring great gain. 
And it will also silence materialism and selfishness. And no matter, no matter our age, each day that we grow older is a day that brings us closer to the eternity that we will spend with Jesus in heaven. That's the voice of your good shepherd. But don't take my word for it. Listen to his. This is what your shepherd says to you this morning. I myself will tend my sheep. I will search for the lost. I will bring back the strays. I will care for the injured. I will strengthen the weak. I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them. I will bring them to their own land. There they will feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. That, my friends, is the voice of your good shepherd. Follow him. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace.